How's it going, folks? Mark from Like-Minded Lunatics here, and uh, the Like-Minded Lunatics crew kind of wanted to do an EVH retrospective. Uh, reacting to videos was something that I thought would be fun to do, and the very first video I wanted to do was Panama. Uh, I did autograph Turn Up the Radio first because I thought if I'm going to screw up, I'm going to do it with autograph, not Van Halen. Um, but Van Halen was always the first one I wanted to do. So I've got, uh, I've got Ricky here with me. Uh, Ricky, why don't you introduce yourself to the folks? You've done some stuff with us before. You're part of the crew. But let them know kind of your academic and like professional playing background, if you would. Sure. Uh, I'm Ricky Hall. I'm a, a senior lecturer of music at Texas State University. So I'm a music professor there. I do music technology, uh, experimental music, things like that. I'm a Woodwind, a sax, flute, clarinet was my major instrument. And then a piano minor. I do a lot of synthesizer stuff. And uh, I started actually playing guitar in eighth grade. I went to, it was in the 80s, and I went to a mall and there was a little guitar store. And I saved up all this money and bought a, a guitar. I actually got a Kramer guitar, which is a brand that was endorsed by Eddie Van Halen for a while. And ended up taking guitar lessons for about three years and played in garage bands and I even did musicals because I can read really well and all that and a uh, huge Van Halen fan I mean I had I remember 1984 on record and I didn't know what a synthesizer was I was like how's he doing this on guitar you know all the kids are saying that and so I'm glad to be here thanks thanks for inviting me man yeah absolutely and one of the things I really wanted to talk to you about is just kind of both the academic side of the type of music that he created and maybe the impact he had on music as a whole, you know, popular music and kind of in academics. And then just as a gigging musician, I know that you talked about before, like as a kid, as a, as a teenager, and I'm sure up into your twenties, you actually gigged as a musician doing, doing actual shows and stuff. I, I really am just kind of interested in your perspective from both of those things, because I'm a musical idiot other than listening to it. Mm. I, I can't really bring anything to the conversation. Um, I know for me, I, I wrote about it on Facebook, but I know, so folks that don't know, I grew up in the middle of the country and country music was really the only station we had. We were almost close enough to get 97.1 out of Dallas, but my parents, they listened to country almost exclusively. So it wasn't up until like the third or fourth grade before I actually heard rock and roll. That's not a lie. I mean, it just wasn't around. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a friend who moved out in the country. His name was Jason and Jason's dad had an enormous record collection it was amazing and greg was a huge van halen fan and so i remember staying over at jason's house in the morning we would get up real early so we could play with the records when his dad wasn't up and we would listen to van halen and acdc those are the two bands that we listened to constantly mm -hmm. and i remember as a kid hearing that that eruption solo and I, i've got it in a second maybe we can we'll, we'll share the screen in a second yeah and just hearing that as a kid it almost sounded like another language to me. And I went back and re-listened to it, and it sounds like the guitar is talking in a language we can't understand. Yeah. And I know a lot, of, a lot of guitarists, like Steve Vai has done this, and uh, um, quite a few have used a talk box to actually talk through the guitar. But Eddie sounded like the damn guitar was speaking another language. And that was the impression I got from it. What about you, Ricky? What was like, kind of like your first impression of it? Yeah, it's like... Uh... It's like the guitar was kind of part of him, you know, type of thing. And yeah, I always, it seems like you have guitarists that are really stuck in the technique or the theory of what they're doing. And they can do all this kind of crazy fast stuff and all that. And then you have guitarists that it's all about like sound and exploring the sound of the instrument and, and trying to find these new things, like always trying to find something new. Uh, a new sound or not even just the technique, but just a new way to do things. And I kind of feel like that. It's like some of the, you can see on YouTube, some of the solos, all the incredible sounds, him playing on the back of the neck and at the headstock, all the little tinkly and all of these, it's just, he was just, um, I think he was really interested in sound, you know? And, and of course the technique is, uh, an added bonus in there of all, all the craziness he did. Um, but yeah, it's just all the, all the great, interesting sounds. And I've read several interviews with, uh, with professional musicians. And one of the things they talk about is just kind of his, it was a paradigm shift during that time period. You know, I've, I've seen, like, I've got an interview with Steve Vai where he, he wrote an article and I'll, I'll link all this stuff that we're going to talk about you guys. I'll link that in the description on YouTube. 
but he, he wrote a, a, a retrospective on Eddie yesterday. And one of the things that he said was that, and I can just read this to you, Rick. I don't know if you looked at it. Um, but what Steve Vai said was that he thought that there were monoliths in music, people who changed the thing so much that he, he considered them monolithic. And he considered Eddie a monolith. And he said that Robert Johnson, Jimi Hendrix, and EVH. Um, and he said for him, those were just the monoliths of guitar. Wait, do you kind of agree with that? Is that something that you, you agree yeah, with? Yeah, you know, I mean, Steve Vai can hold his own, but he played with Frank Zappa, so right. he, knows, he knows what he's talking about. You know, he's played with a... Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think, because um, I was really thinking about this yesterday, I'm I'm a Generation Xer. I'm sure you are. I'm an 80s kid. Yeah. You know, I'm in the 80s, I graduated from high school in 1991. I'm, I'm proud of it. And right in the middle of the 80s is when I really started, I started playing guitar and getting into it and reading magazines. And I still have all my, I got dozens of magazines and stuff. And I would say probably the, the two quintessential guitarists of my generation when people were growing up to play were Eddie Van Halen and Randy Rhodes. Yeah. You, know, you could maybe put Stevie Ray Vaughan in there too. Uh, but like the, the kind of mainstream guitar where the technique was great, the sound was great, um, and they, you know, kind of took the guitar to another level. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I saw someone talking about Van Halen on the news yesterday, and it was a music professor from, you know, some Columbia or something, talk about how people still like write doctoral dissertations on Eddie Van Halen's music. And, and his technique, and now, and he's going to be in all the history books. And people are going to be talking about him for decades, like trying to figure some of his stuff out, you know. Well, and that's what I'll, I'll read this to you. This is that's kind of what Steve Vai wrote. He says, uh, "Of course, I could never play like him. I never tried. Only an idiot competes with Eddie Van Halen." But I knew that going into it. And he's talking about working with David Lee Roth on "Eat 'Em and Smile." But when you're playing that stuff and you're a guitar player, you see the infrastructure of it and it's just so beautiful. I remember making the Eat 'em and Smile album and we were working with Ted Templeman and he played me just the naked tracks of Edward's guitars. And even just one track, one microphone of Edward's guitar sounded like an orchestra, perfectly packaged in this powerfully dynamic expression. Um, and that's, and again, that's Steve Vai. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he knows that, what he's talking about. And if you watch, if you watch Eddie Van Halen play, very, I mean, I know it sounds cornball and cliched, but very effortless. Makes it look incredibly easy, very natural. Um, and you had texted me this the other day. He always looked like he was having a ball. Like he was, because there's some people that are good guitar players, but it's almost like chopping weeds. You yeah. know, it's kind of painful. And he... He just had a blast. It's like you're sitting on the couch with your bud drinking a beer, just jamming. Yeah, and I think that's a great segue, man. I'm going to go ahead and yeah. share my windows with you. Yeah. Um, folks, give me just a second. I got to make sure I'm sharing everything correctly. Um, but uh, I think what I would like to do is just – there we go. I don't know if you're going to be up there, Rick. it. Let's see. That video. Oh my God. I don't know if I'm doing this correct. No, you can edit. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. So it bounces back and forth between us. Okay, good. Sorry, folks. I tried to test this, but I only tested it with myself, not with someone else. <laughs> um, so Ricky, why don't we do this? Let's, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to play just a little snippet of eruption here and uh, maybe we can talk about it a second. So yeah. for me, this is like Eddie's sound. Steve Vai talks about the Brown sound. Um, and to me, this just sounds like Eddie. Um. <laughs> And that's that finger tapping that he always that he always talked about. And that was that was eruption off Van Halen, Van Halen. That was a minute and forty track. And in my head, that that changed guitar. What, yeah. what do you think, Rick? Yeah, I mean, when that came out, everybody 
was trying to do that. And he didn't invent the technique. He talks about that. He, there were um, a couple of different guitarists that had done a couple of things like that here and there. I think the, the guitarist for Genesis and some other, but uh, um, yeah, he like kind of defined that technique and everyone kind of wanted to do it. And I read, there's a story that his brother, Alex, when he would do that said, man, when you're doing that tapping stuff, you need to turn around so people can't see you. So they don't steal it from you. You need to play with your back to the audience so uh, they don't see it from you. Well, and one of the things, you talked about this a second ago. This is, uh, this, uh, this video footage is from, I think, the 5150 tour. Yeah. Um, and it's the eruption solo. But I kind of wanted to watch it, not necessarily for eruption, because we've all heard that, but just for Edward's demeanor. The way, like you talked about, it, he seems like your buddy. He doesn't seem like a swaggering guitar hero. He seems like your friend going, hey, man, check this out. I like here Ricky maybe you can speak to it is just it to me it seems like he is confident enough in his ability that he can sit there and just chill out and have fun with the guitar um it doesn't seem like he's rushing anything it doesn't seem like oh god I gotta make this exciting just, let's just sit here and play yeah I don't know it just it's striking to me just how effortless he he, he does it. <laughs> And his smile. That's something I will never forget either. We, we, did, did you see them live, Ricky? I did. W what year was that? Uh, it was OU812. So what, what was that? Um, that was right after 5150. So 90... 93 maybe or so? I was in college. Maybe sometime. Yeah, probably so. Something like that. Yeah, it was great. I mean, they were amazing. They were phenomenal. And I'd heard it, they were kind of sometimes hit and miss sometimes they were great sometimes they're a little rusty um but i mean all the concerts i've seen they were and it was it was a great concert it was and they went like over two hours yeah they were they were machines and i i saw them in 2004 the last tour they did with hagar mm -hmm. and uh, i remember and i talked about this on facebook a lot of a lot of guitar solos are, are fine with me but sometimes during the middle of the middle of the act, it seems kind of self-indulgent. I don't know how else to, to put it. Right. It almost seemed like with Van Halen, every song was building up to Ed's big solo. Mm -hmm. That was almost the, you know, the crescendo of the show was his 25 or 30 minute solo, which was unheard of. Yeah. And it never felt like, come on, get the band back on stage. It was always like, oh, this is what we came for. This is it right here. Yeah. And all the guitar guys that I'm with, we're not cheering. We're Everyone's watching, you know, you're, you're a, staring, you're trying to take notes. <laughs> okay. You know, you're staring at him trying to see. That's them. a great point. Cause I, I remember seeing the guns and roses and when paradise city comes on, you can almost not hear Axel because now that is a crowd song. That song is no longer the band's. That song is our song. Everyone right. sings along. You can hardly hear them play. Yeah. But when, when Ed did his solo, it was silent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there were moments of clapping, but for the most part, let's listen to what Ed's doing. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that I thought was really cool is how his solos changed. And maybe, maybe you can talk about that in just a second. But this is a solo from 2015, and it's more similar to what I heard him do in 2004 than the, uh, than the old eruption. <laughs> this is at the Hollywood Bowl, 2015.
Now, to me, Ricky, that almost sounds like flamenco. But again, I'm a musical idiot. What is he doing there? Yeah, it's. I mean, I think it's it's something like that. He's he's um he's just playing the high strings, and then he's fingering stuff on his low strings. So he's kind of doing this bass line while he's going so along he play, with it. Is he playing rhythm for himself? Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. And you know he. Van Halen talked a lot about how he didn't really listen to music. I don't know if you've heard him say that. Yeah. But he didn't really listen to a lot of music that was going on. But part of me thinks he was maybe in t- trying to kind of expand his his style and his, his musical taste and all that. Because, yeah, this does not sound like Western music. This sounds like something that's Eastern European or... or uh, Latin or something like that type of thing. And, and, and what's, uh, you, you told me this before, what's the academic term for that when you're using non-Western music in Western music? We talked about it with Big Pig. Exoticism. Okay, exoticism. Ex- exotic exoticism. Mm-hmm. And that's the, that's the term in the academy for when you- Yeah, that's, that's kind of the fancy, the fancy term, yeah. Okay. And then he does something here in just a second that uh, the first time I heard it was in 2004. Maybe he was doing it earlier, but it, it's a weird, tone that he starts What's he doing there, Ricky? He's just, he's, uh, he's slapping with his hand, right? With both hands, actually. Kind of creating this kind of polyrhythm thing on there. I think that's how he begins the song. They begin the song Mean Streets. Oh, yes. Um, type of thing. Yeah. So it's almost like using the guitar as a drum set, almost. <laughs> Which would make sense because he started drums first and Alex started guitar and then they ended up swapping. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, I sent you this link that I just absolutely love. Um, This was before their appearance on uh, Jimmy Kimmel's show. Somebody's Mm -hmm. on the roof of the building opposite their band, and Eddie is the one who does the sound check. Yeah. And this this noise that he makes to me, just, it's an Eddie Van Halen noise. Let me see if I can... That, that scream, uh, it's so iconic to me. Yeah, yeah. Again, that's a sound that I just, in my head, I immediately attach to Eddie Van Halen. Mm-hmm. What is he doing different that other guitarists were not doing that makes it so distinctive when he does it? It's, um, I mean, it can, it, there's probably a lot of factors that can have something to do with, you know, the amplifiers you're using and he's got some pedals and also the guitars and he was notorious for uh, tweaking these guitars, you know, and customizing them and cannibalizing them. And, you know, his famous guitar, they called Frankenstein. because he, Yeah. He put a bunch of different ones together. And, but I think some of it too is just like, it's, it's kind of feel and the way you, it's even with all this wattage and everything, it's just certain ways you play the strings and the way you hold the strings and the way, I think there's a lot of finesse and that's how people get their certain sound is, it, it's more than just kind of knowing all the notes in, in the neck and kind of hacking away. There's this kind of finesse to it. And and I think that's one of those things that pr- we'll probably never figure out, uh, you know, with it, with with Eddie Van Halen or, or Yo-Yo Ma or even the way Thelonious Monk played. There are aspects of music that I don't think we can explain. 
Hmm. You just kind of, you just kind of got it or you don't, you know? And when you do have it and you can really express yourself and find your sound, which is incredibly difficult, especially for an electronic instrument that you just kind of achieved another level. So in, 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 Traditional Japanese martial arts, there's, uh, there are a couple of say- sayings that come to mind. There's something called uh, Mushi no Kokoro and then Mitsu no Kokoro. Mushi no Kokoro basically means the art of no mind. And Mitsu no Kokoro basically means mind like water. And one of the Japanese concepts is that you have to learn basics and you have to learn movements to such a degree that you're able to forget them in the moment. And they just happen naturally. That... Mm-hmm consciously thinking of these things messes you up and so you have to you have to practice things so many times that your mind is empty when it happens and i mean what you're saying that kind of reminds me of that is i think that's a really good i think that's very on point yeah and i I like that you mentioned just a moment ago the way that you learn it the, the the degree of mastery again in 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 japanese well not just in martial arts but in all teachings are all teaching subjects. There are honorifics that you use for the instructors. So like sensei in Japanese, all that means is having walked the path. That's all it means. So mm-hmm. someone that's done it before you. Mm-hmm. But then there are additional honorifics that as you go up the ladder, there's Rinshi and all these other different honorifics. But the last one is one called Hanshi. And a Hanshi is a, a gentleman scholar is the way it translates to. So not only someone who knows all the material, not only someone who has walked the path, but someone who is representative of that discipline is kind of the way that, that they talk about it. Yeah. And to me, that's what, what Eddie seemed like, a hanshi, a, a gentleman scholar of that, of that instrument. Yeah. Um, I want to watch this video too. This, was, this is from 1978. And yeah. one of the things I find interesting here, I, I, I said a few minutes ago, I always felt like here, or after listening to his guitar, it almost feels like it's speaking. I love this because it's essentially Dave whistle singing back and forth with the guitar. Mm-hmm. Um, To me, it almost seems like they're going back and forth and they're meeting note for note, but Dave is doing it with his voice and Ed's doing it with the guitar. Yeah, yeah. That's so awesome, man. Um, I wanted to show you this. I, so obviously I'm a musical dum-dum, um, <laughs> but I loved them. And uh, I grew up on a dairy farm and dad was one of the directors of AMPI, the American Milk Producers Incorporated uh during the 80s and uh, early 90s and so he always had um insights into their advertising campaigns like before they came out Mm -hmm. and i remember him coming back from one of the 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 uh the meetings and saying you're gonna love the new ad campaign and uh when it came out it was eddie and alex on the the got milk thing (laughs) yeah and uh this is what (laughs) this is what it says at the bottom of all the lead singers we've had, most never got enough calcium. Typical. But not for me and Alex, because every time we change singers, we have an extra glass of milk. That way, we're sure to get more than the recommended three glasses a day. As you can see, sometimes all at once. And that was the, that was the picture that they had. And Dad was so excited to tell me that, that Eddie was going to be part of their, uh, their advertising campaign. <laughs> That's crazy. I never knew that. <laughs> Um, one of the other things I wanted to look at with you here, Ricky was, uh, and I sent this to you before was Michael Jackson's reaction to his playing. Yeah. Um, we talked about Steve Vai talking about what a mastery was, but man, this is such a good reaction from Michael Jackson a musical genius in his own right yeah. to watching Eddie play.
love that, man. In that moment, Michael Jackson is us. Michael Jackson, a musical genius, is us just watching it. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know if you know the story of Beat It, but, you know, it, it, Thriller was produced by Quincy Jones, who is a huge name in music and particularly in jazz and even uh, um, a pop and all those kinds of things. And Quincy Jones was classically trained. He was studied under Nadia Boulanger, who was a teacher that taught like Aaron Copeland and Leonard Bernstein, all these people. And he wanted, he always wanted to record something with Eddie Van Halen. And the story is he called Eddie Van Halen in the studio. And then it was like, I don't know what you're going to do, but I want you to do something. So to, especially at that time for Quincy Jones to call you, you know, and, and then uh, Eddie Van Halen heard, beat it. he's like, hey, I kind of like this tune, you know, let me, and I think he even gave them some pointers on the song structure, like cut a few things out and then uh, did a couple of solos and then Michael Jackson heard it and was like, wow, yeah, that's pretty good and all that. And I remember in school, that and you talked about this. He didn't want credit. He was like he didn't want credit or anything for it. He didn't get paid for it. He was he was happy to do it. Uh, there was that kind of rumor. Hey, I think that's Eddie Van Halen. I was like, nah, you know, are you, really? And of course, he didn't have the internet or anything. But that was that kind of rumor that swelled around. Is well, is it Van Halen? It sounds like him. Nah, Eddie Van Halen, Michael Jackson. But well, but I love him? that too because I, I I think it just speaks to the fact that Eddie just liked to play guitar. Yeah. And he played, you know, there's Michael Jackson, but he also played for like LL Cool J and he played for, uh, he did some stuff, I think, with Sabbath and he did um, all kind, like very eclectic. I think he did some country stuff for some people. He also did a complete soundtrack for his friend who was a porn director for his porn film. Oh, there you go. Sacred Sin is the name of it. And nice. He did, the, he did the entire soundtrack because the guy was apparently complaining, I can't afford a soundtrack. So Ed's like, man, I'll do it. And so he did it at 5150 and gave it to him. <laughs> That's great, man. <laughs> great. And then I, I wanted to look at this too. I, everyone knows about this. But uh, from Back to the Future, apparently Spielberg and Zemeckis contacted the band's representatives and asked if they could use Van Halen in this scene. Rep said no. And then Ed heard, and he was like, no, we can do that. And so he recorded this solo. And the reason it says Edward Van Halen instead of Van Halen is because the band said no. Eddie said yes. Uh. And so this, is, this scene is because Eddie thought it would be fun to do. Yeah. The cassette tape. <laughs> And there we go, Edward yeah. Van Halen. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought that was funny that Eddie thought, yeah. man, you know what? We'll do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I wonder if they, I don't know, I wonder if they said, okay, he's going to say he's from a different planet or whatever. So do, and you know, he just went after it. I know. What did he, what did they tell him on the day of? I would yeah. have loved to have been in the studio for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The other thing that was interesting, I don't know if you, uh, I don't know if you've seen Bill and Ted face the music yet. Have y'all had a chance to watch it? I have not seen it yet. I'm looking forward to it. So there is a scene in there that Alex Winter said that they wrote for Eddie and they contacted him and Eddie said he wanted to do it but for personal reasons, he couldn't. Mm -hmm. And Alex said, we had no idea what was going on. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a thing for a Rolling Stone yesterday as well. He said, we had no idea what was going on, but now sadly we do. But right. when you watch Bill and Ted face the music, it will become apparent immediately. There's a scene that was written for Eddie that he was sadly unable to do. Uh -huh. um, and I don't know if, you, if you've seen the interviews, but apparently after Bill and Ted 1 came out, MTV asked Eddie, would you play with Wild Stallion after the film came out? And he was like, they never called me. I would have played with them. <laughs> and they talk about him all the time in the movie. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the last thing I kind of want to ask you about, Ricky, and this is a nerdy thing. Um, he gave several interviews. Um, let's see. Let me find it. There we go. He gave several interviews in, with guitar player that I always found fascinating, but completely confusing. Um, so they're asking him about his guitar. And one of, this is what, what Eddie says. He wrote or he responded, 
it's hard to get the guitar in tune perfectly. Any guitar, a guitar is just theoretically built wrong. Each string is an interval of fourths and the B string is off. Theoretically, that's not right. If you tune an open E chord in the first position and it's perfectly in tune, and then you hit a bar chord an octave higher, it's out of tune. The B string is always a motherfucker to keep in tune all the time. So I have to retune for certain songs. What, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, that's the physics of sound, you know, and, and strings and all that kind of stuff. I remember you sending me that and me reading it because I'd never heard that before. Um, but I mean, I've heard some people, you know, talk about how, oh, the guitar is a little funky or this doesn't work, that doesn't work. But the thing is in music, there's been hundreds and hundreds of years of experimentation and these tuning systems and the the harmony we use and the, what's called the common practice period, which a lot of music's based on, Van Halen's music's based on, is just, is kind of developed into what we have today. And I mean, string instruments, the guitar tuning is the same. It's the same tuning as like a upright bass or contra bass. Okay. And the, the tunings of like violins and, and violas and stuff are in fifths and, and a lot of string instruments are in some type of fourths or fifths. And I think that just came from the way music has developed that we typically use like one, four, five chords and all that kind of stuff. And that's just kind of, I think the reason he said that is because he was trying to go beyond that. Gotcha. Right. And he, so, and if you look at it, like any of his tapping stuff and all that, he, all these huge stretches, cause he's trying to get these intervals that you can't get on two or three strings. He's trying to do it on one string. So I don't know. I don't mean to speak for him, but it makes me think he's just trying to kind of go beyond what the guitar uh, could naturally do. You know, gotcha. well, I don't know if you've seen it, but apparently he submitted a patent for a new way to hold a guitar. Have you ever mm -hmm. seen that? Uh, I haven't. So it's this really weird rig that essentially turns the guitar into a piano that you put on your chest. Oh, okay. So that, so that you can tap, not on, not like this, but like yeah. this, like you would playing a piano. Ah. It's fascinating. I'll, I'll link to it in the description. And I'll send it to you. But he, yeah, has, I would love he has drawings of himself, and it's a U.S. patent for it. And yeah. it's drawings of Edward Van Halen holding this rig where it's showing all the patent components. That's really hip. I would love to see that. I yeah. know he, he had patented like a couple of different guitar parts. I think like a, a certain type of tuss rod, which connects the neck to the body. And he, he had figured a couple of things out. So I'm not surprised that he would come up with something like that. And he was, you know, his first instrument was piano. Right. Before drums. Um, so it doesn't surprise me. Well, and I've read interviews with him as well, where he talks about if you, if you are educated in classical music, you should be able to hear like Mozart and Beethoven in some of my solos. I've heard him, I've read him say that before. Yeah, no, for sure. That's definitely a signature of his, of his style. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, what a loss, man. I was, uh, I, I wasn't lying when I put this on Facebook. I was, I was jogging. I was on the treadmill when my friend Tank emailed me and told me, and I just, it crushed me, dude. I, I had yeah. to pull up videos and I sat on the floor and I cried. Yeah. I, I really don't know why I, he, again, to use Steve Vai's words, he was such a monolith in my life musically. Again, I'm a musical dummy. I just, I'm a fan of it. But as far as like who I am as a person, I feel like my heart is always playing Van Halen. Um, yeah, it know. took, it took my breath away. I probably, the closest was when I heard like Kurt Cobain died and I was in college then, but my high school, my daughter in high school texted me during lunch and said, hey, Eddie Van Halen. And I was like, oh, no, you, you saw something on TikTok, whatever, you know? Yeah. And then she sent me a, a news article about it. And yeah, I was like, I like literally took my breath away. And I got to tell you this real quick. And I've actually been talking with some students about this. So my daughter is a junior in high school. She's 16. And a lot of the high school kids were talking about Eddie Van Halen died. And then I go to drop her off the next morning. And the seniors can paint their parking spaces and some seniors had repainted and one of them she showed me a picture he painted it like the paint job behind you the frankenstein you know and i thought these are kids that my daughter goes to high school that are um kind of mourning the death of this guy who 
his band, their grandparents probably listened to. Yeah. Like I thought that because I was like, their parents probably are, were around the mid 2000s or so, right? Or early 2000s. So their parents' parents would have been listening to 1984 and uh, Ben Halen 1 and all that kind of stuff. And I, I, I think of when I was in high school, nobody listened to what your grandparents, nobody cared. You right. know, I, mean, I don't even know what my grandparents were listening to. But now, like, that really tells you what a big cultural and musical impact they've made is you have multiple generations. And this is, this is a heavy metal band. Yeah. You know, this, it really is mind blowing. And I've been talking with my students about that, about how, you know, it, uh, what an effect that band and Eddie Van Halen had on music in general. Anyway. Well, and this is something I kind of wanted to ask you too, before we kind of start wrapping up. Um, I, we go to ACL every year, whenever it, whenever it obviously didn't happen this year, but we go to a lot of live shows. And one of the things that I kind of lament as, as an, you know, a mid forties music lover is kind of the, the instrumentation in bands. I, I don't get the sense in a lot of rock bands. And I don't know how to describe this again. I don't have the terms for it, but it feels like to me with older rock and roll, there is an ebb and flow within the song of vocals, instrumentation and moments for those things to be highlighted where now a lot of the music sounds flat to me. I don't know how else to explain it, Ricky. And again, I'm, I, I don't have the terms, but it sounds flat to me. So everything is balanced out. There's no moment for any one thing to shine. And I'm wondering if I'm hoping that we're getting a resurgence of, of that type of music. And I don't know what you think about that. And Van Halen definitely had that. There was Dave, there was Eddie, there was Alex, and they all shone at certain times. You are exactly right. That That is where music was and it's not that way anymore. And it, it's a lot of different factors. It can be uh, technology and recording. And now we, we're kind of into something everyone calls the loudness wars, where whenever things recorded, you're trying to crank it up. So they add something called the limiter and everyone's trying to, and when you are trying to crank up the, the overall mix, you lose finesse in there. Mm -hmm. And there's also something called compression where they take the loud and soft and match it in the middle. And it, then you take the whole, song and you can make it louder and every a lot of stuff's over compressed so you miss this ebb and flow it's all just kind of it's one dynamic it's one direction and uh i think a lot another thing is you know there's not a lot of like big personalities in music i mean there are but not like not like you know the people's personalities don't often reflect in these bands, you hear a band, you're like, oh, it's a good band, but I couldn't name who the members were. Yes, I, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. It's, as opposed to like ACDC or, or a Van Halen or Rush, where there are these distinct personalities that come out in the songs. I don't know if that really happens that much anymore. Maybe Foo Fighters, but even then, I don't know. I think you're right, too. That's such a good point. I do feel like that the instrumentation and the vocals of a lot of the older acts were expressions of the people themselves. Yeah. And now it almost feels like the music is external from the people. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the acts that we've seen at, at ACL, I feel like, you know what, you can just play this shit over the loudspeaker and those guys can go in the back because they're not doing anything other than playing. I don't yeah. want to sound dismissive of what they're doing. Right. It's not a performative show. Yeah. Um, like we saw Greta Van Fleet, they put on a performative show where mm -hmm you know, there was an ebb and flow. Yeah, and they, yeah, yeah. But a lot like, L, uh, was it LCD sound system? Is that, that I remember oh, yeah. them very specifically. Yeah. The entire yeah. time. And I think musicianship isn't as important or emphasized as it was. And part of that could be, you know, there's not as much like performances there used to be. People don't get in a bus and tour a hundred cities like they used to. And, you had to be able to play. You couldn't fake it. You couldn't go in a studio and say, I'm going to do 20 takes, take tw take eight, let's do take 18 and tweak it for me and auto correct and all that kind of stuff. It's like, you had to know your stuff, you know? Right. And some of the early recording, and you can hear it in Van Halen 1, I think there's several songs on there where it's all of them 
in their corners of the room and it's one take. Right. There's no overdubbing or anything. It's like you got it or you don't. Yeah. And you had to know your you had to know your shit, man. And, and there's a sense of immediacy to the music when it's like that too. I yeah. Mean, I think there's a sense of immediacy, a, a sense of um, there's it's an organic feeling to organic, it. Organic. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I'm I'm hopeful. I, and I know, I don't know if you've looked at the analytics, but like some of the some of the reactions I've done, like the Van Halen one is the most watched one. Yeah. Um, and looking on YouTube's analytics themselves, people are watching Metallica more than they are like some modern bands. And so it fills me with a little bit of hope that maybe there's going to be a paradigm shift again. And hopefully some of that will become important again. Yeah, I hope so. I, I bet there will be. I bet I'll get there. Well, Ricky, thank you for doing this with me. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's it, Like I said, it really bummed me out. It yeah, it was a bummer, but you know this was this was very therapeutic. Is to kind of celebrate his his legacy and his music and see all these great. We have an opportunity to watch all these videos and hear these recordings. Yeah, and, uh, you saw I posted. I did a bike ride. Uh, I did a I rode twelve miles the other day, and I listened to his Van Halen. Yeah, you know, and and just kind of. Um, I don't think it's really a time to be sad it's like we should celebrate this guy because he, he's going to be around a long time and and he did some great stuff well and i can't remember who said it i should have looked it up before but you saying that reminded me of the uh, the aphorism we can be sad that it ended but we should also be happy that it happened yeah and, uh, I, I feel like that's true yeah. um and maybe i'll i'll leave us with this ricky and then i'll, I'll stop the recording uh in best of both worlds one of the stanzas reads you don't have to die to go to heaven or hang around to be born again. Just tune in to what this place has to offer because we may never be here again. Um, Amen. Yeah. So maybe we'll leave there. Hopefully this was cathartic. I know it was for me. Yeah. So hopefully it was for some other folks too. Um, yeah. All right, Ricky. Well, thank you. I'll stop the recording here. Take care. Folks. Okay. Mm -hmm.